We're not broadcasting it to the world. Well, welcome to May 12th, 2020. Um, we've been doing this for a few weeks now, and I still feel that I'm, I'm struggling to, to, to work on the technology, but I hope that it's all working for you. It's feeling like a little, little more normal today. Um, I sent out an agenda yesterday um, simply to get us started on some discussion topics but please feel free to let any of us know if you'd like to talk about anything that is not on the agenda the first thing that I put on the agenda was um, just checking in we had a fantastic webinar on Wednesday with Catherine Schoofs from the Aram Public Library in Delavan. Um, she discussed some teen and tween programming ideas and especially ideas that can be used for this current summer um, and beyond. We had five nearly 500 we had 470 people attend that webinar and it was fantastic um, people from all over the country attended and it was really um, reassuring to me to see the types of questions that were coming in from our colleagues around the country they're the same questions that we've been having and that we've been discussing so we're not alone it um, I think provided an opportunity for a bunch of people to connect so thank you to those of you who were in attendance um, or who have watched the, the video is there any discussion do you, do we want to talk about anything that came up did it bring up any ideas or questions okay Jean Anderson and I have been talking about ways that we can continue to do continuing education um, through this time. And I just want to give a shout out to Karen Went. Um, thanks to Karen, we have two webinars coming up next week about storytelling and storytelling technique. Those webinars will be delivered by Heather Frost. Um, she's a storyteller. Is that right, Karen? Forest. For, I'm Forest. sorry. I, 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 I see her name differently. Thank you. Um, Heather Forrest from New York State. And um, she is a traditional storyteller. And she's going to um, provide two webinars. Um, those webinars have a max at 24 people each. And they are only open to South Central Library System librarians. So it's a much smaller group. It's a much more intimate group. Um, those programs will not be recorded. And we're going to try using Zoom um, breakout rooms, which is something I haven't done yet. I don't know if any of you have. Um, so feel free to register for one of those. I think they're gonna be really great. And Karen, thank you so much for arranging that for us as part of your, your contract with Heather. It's gonna be quite exciting. Yeah, did, did you have anything to add, Karen? She'll be performing um, via Zoom on July 8th for Monona Public Library. So if you wanna watch her then, but I mean, you know, if you were ever going to get her, this would be a great time to do it. <laughs> well, and that will be a great time then to, to watch her perform too. I've been thinking about so many performers are doing these mini performer showcases. Also, she will be next year for the Northland Storytelling Conference. She'll be in Madison area. So if you wanted to wait for next April, like Children's Book Week. Um, that's the reason I booked her originally was for oh, book week during, okay. while she was going to be here during Northlands, but then she canceled being no here for Northlands because Northlands canceled. Yeah. So next year she will be on the roster for the end of April. Thank you. Thank you. So anything to add about our webinars? Okay. Let's see, um, next on the agenda, and this is something that I really would like um, some discussion about, is we, um, 
right now, and Julie from Verona and I were emailing about this yesterday, uh, summer library program incentives, the incentives that come from us. Um, right now, delivery is not going out, but our plan is a bunch of the incentives have been printed. Some of them have not. Schuster's, for example, has not been printed because we print those in-house and we're holding off a little bit on those. But some of the printed um, coupons, I think, Matt, well, we don't know what Madison Mallard's or um, Wisconsin Rapids Rafters are doing. We don't know whether or not they're going to even have a season this year. So incentives are kind of up in the air. Our plan is to send out whatever we receive to libraries based on what you requested before the world changed. Julie's concern in, um, well, for, uh, Julie, you can, you can speak your, your own concern. And I know Heather, you and I talked about this and a few others, we've talked about what do we do with these paper incentives this year? Um, it's completely up to you to use these incentives as you choose, but I wanted to provide some space and time for all of you to talk together about what you're thinking about. And maybe some of you have some ideas and some solutions. So um, does somebody wanna kick that conversation off if you've given some thought to it? Uh, uh, Heather. Oh, oh Julie, yeah, Julie, why don't you start because I've had the most recent conversation with you. Okay. Um, so we had initially just been taking a wait and see approach, thinking that maybe if we were open to the point where people could come in, can you hear me first of all? Yeah. Okay. That people could come in, that we would distribute them maybe just in two sets to minimize how many times people would interact with us. So like one chunk of coupons one for one threshold of logging their minutes in a second um, set. And we also have two free books that we give out. Um, but now, but we also wanted to implement maybe a curbside pickup option, but for us, we're doing curbside nine to six Monday through Friday, and we're still booking out three days in advance. So our director doesn't really want us to add to that by just having a curbside pickup coupons only potentially. So then we looked at the possibility of mailing, but, and maybe you realize this already, but I just didn't really realize it until yesterday that Beanstack actually does not allow you to have a registration field for address. Everything has to be um, multiple choice. So that's not really an option. And it would have been actually quite costly to try and mail them out as well. But we were just looking at that as an option too. So now we're at the point where we're like, well, if a lot of these experiences aren't possibly going to be happening anyway, maybe we just don't do any of them. And it's possible we're behind you guys and just figuring this all out. Um, we're just, we were just kind of waiting, I guess, but now we're coming to the conclusion that we will most likely not um, do that. Maybe when they come in to get, get their free, free books, eventually we'll stick our Culver's coupon in there because our Verona Culver's does give us one of those. Um, and maybe Pizza Hut too, because that's another one that conceivably should be able to be redeemed at this point. So that's where we are. And I was just curious with how the rest of you are going about this. Thanks, Julie. Heather? And then we'll go to Karen. Yeah, we're also doing cluster. I wish that um, if we could get coupon codes, I'd do intervals because we can do them as part of the badges on Beanstack. But because um, we don't have coupon codes right now for any of the big stuff, I would assume that Dane County Fair is not happening. Um, I would assume at this point, Mallards is not going to happen. Um, Dane County has made it very clear that until the middle of July, they don't want big events or even medium-sized events happening. Um, but yeah, we're probably going to do what you're doing, which is at the very, we give our books at the end of where you're finished with five sections and we're just going to cluster everything together. Now, how they're going to pick that up, we haven't figured that out because like Verona, we are having huge um, schedules for curbside right now and we started book bundling people can order book bundles from us and uh, that's just increased the pickup time so we're not quite sure we or we're looking at ordering lockers for long term and putting them outside but that's not going to end up happening until September probably 
So if we, if we could get codes, it'd be really awesome, but I know that's tough. Yeah. Karen, you had your hand raised too. Um, Heather mentioned that Beanstack doesn't allow addresses, so we can't collect addresses. Somebody asked a question about that in the chat. Um, yeah, we're, we're struggling with the same problem, and we, on our website so far for summer, have decided not to put any specific information at all about prize collections. Um, I think we wrote, so far, we wrote something like, you will be contacted. <laughs> um, we're playing around with possibly not giving anything out at all in any manner or form during June and July for sure. And then waiting to see what August, September brings, which means we won't be doing anything that has an expiration date of June, July, August, or September probably. So everything will have to expire after September in order for us to use it. And then we were trying to figure out, okay, well, we can't mail them because we don't have addresses. We don't want to do curbside pickup because we're already really busy with that. And, you know, if we hit our potential for number of people collecting prizes, that would be 700 people that we would be trying to have come to our doors to pick up prizes. So we're still looking for the answer, but playing around with just not doing anything because that's why we have Beanstack. They give those digital badges. <laughs> Andrea. Well, I'm just wondering, brainstorming here as we're talking about this, has anybody discovered whether or not we can upload images? to Beanstack? I mean, I know we can put our own artwork in, but it occurs to me, is there a way to make these digital so that they have to be printed out? Probably not, but I'm wondering. <clears throat> Go ahead, Heather. Um, so <clears throat> from what I gather, like with the, I know with the grand prizes that you're building with tickets, you can put images in. Um, I'm not sure with each badge portion if we'd be able to attach a JPEG. That's a really good, now I'm going to have to go play. I'm just, I'm like three quarters of the way through building my Beanstack site right now. So now I'm like, okay, now I, that's a good idea to like, maybe if there's a UPC on those coupons that they can have scanned or a QR code rather than having to hand them paper um, might be a good thing too. But I know you, with the grand prizes, you can put pictures up. I'm thinking, you know, if that's a barrier for someone, then those would be the people we would make the exception for, and they could come in and get the literal coupon, but other people could just print it off. Yeah. Or we could even scan and, like, send it to them, too, from our youth services accounts. That's true, because we'll have their emails. Yeah. So I guess the wonder, the next question for me is, would all of those vendors be okay with that? Because clearly they could print off multiples whether they were earned or not. And I don't know if that's a, an issue. I guess that's where my brain goes to, Andrea, as the person who's coordinated some of these partnerships. Um, there are some partners who are very concerned about too many coupons being printed or shared or coupon from one child be given to another. Um, there, there is a lot of concern about the mishandling of coupons. I'll, I'll put it politely that way. Um, and and some, some people are more concerned about that than others. Uh, Karen just asked, are partners willing to move expiration dates to early spring? You know, we could ask about that. I know a bunch of the coupons have already been printed. Are you good? Hi, Emily. We can hear you. If you want to oh, mute yourself, that's okay. That's okay. Um, so, you know, I think that what my hope or my plan is after our meeting today is to send just an email out to all of our providers you know, give them an update, 
this is where we are, where are you? And I love the idea of, you know, we could ask about scanning and sending, um, and also are you willing to move your expiration date, I think might be an easier ask. So I can add that to the email to them. You know, some people, some of the providers like um, Schuster's, Eichster's, you know, their, their season is only for a limited period of time as well. What else would you like me to ask the providers, the coupon providers? Can you think of anything? Send me, I won't send it until later this week. So if you think of anything, let me know. So for the people who reached out to me, Julie and Heather, um, did this conversation provide any assistance for you at all? Okay, okay. Um, at, we have not printed Schuster's, so we're waiting to hear from them. I mean, my concern also is about the environment, the planet, um, because we do print so many of these, um, and, and, you know, happily we print them. But if we have thousands of these coupons that we're not going to use, um, then we might have lots of uh, scrap paper with Schuster's tickets on the back of them, and that's okay, too. <laughs> Did you say if Eichsters has printed theirs yet? Because I feel like those are, are so, like, there's so much paper and printing involved in those. I wish, I hope that they are waiting. We've asked them um, to wait. And we've also asked them to, you know, hold back or to cut back on the, the brochure format, which is something that they're very um, committed to, to printing. So... I haven't received anything, any information from them. Kelly, I'm looking at Kelly Allen from um, Oregon. They, she often connects with Kelly too. Have you heard anything? No, I haven't heard anything okay. from Eichsters. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks to Kelly. She often, Kelly and I think Amanda, sometimes you've distributed them from Stoughton too. So yeah. um, there, there's a lot of excitement that goes on behind, behind the scenes of getting these items sent out and shipped out to everybody. Yeah, and Amanda asked, are they even open? I don't know. I don't know if these places are even opening. And I haven't connected with them since early March. So it, it would be a good time. And Heidi Mo is doing a bunch of connection too. So she and I need to check in. Um, Heather thinks they're allowed to open starting the 13th. So uh, we, we shall see. We shall see. But I just wanted to provide that opportunity to discuss incentives. Anything else about that topic? All right. Thank you. Stay tuned. And please reach out to me and um, use kids list to share with each other. I feel that you guys are much more um, up to date on Beanstack than I have. I haven't even gone into the sandbox yet. I did attend yesterday's webinar, which was very helpful for me. So I'm hoping to find some time this week to play around. Do we want to spend a little time talking about Beanstack? Connecting with each other. Andrea likes it. Heather, you're nodding your head. Anyone else? Any other questions? Check out the, the chat. Andrea, yep. Yeah. Oh, or Amanda. Oh, Andrea. Andrea and then Amanda. Sorry. <laughs> I, um, I'm just running into issues with, you know, not having, I guess, the time to think everything out because we typically do um, something for the very young and then school-aged kids and then teens and adults. And so, of course, as I'm building the one for the very youngest, I'm thinking, what can I reuse? What can I reuse? And so... I guess I'm just wondering if anybody else is there too, and have you found anything that is working um, time efficiently for you? 
tips. <laughs> I found that um, working off of, because they provide those already created templates. And so I found one that's very close to what I'm already wanting to do. And that seems to be working the best is working off of that. And just, I'm, I'm the admin for our Beanstack account, but I am having um, the adult services and the teen services people will build their own. I'm just doing the really young and the school age, early school age ones, and then they will take care of the rest. But I'm the admin building the base of the site before they come in. Um, but yeah, already built stuff is really nice to be able to, because there is one that's doing points that's almost identical to what I was already doing, so. Thanks, Heather. Amanda, you had your hand up, too. I was just going to comment on, like, everyone with the weary look on their face, like, yes, yeah, so let's talk about being stacked. It's just funny. <laughs> I think Go ahead, Andrea. Sorry, I couldn't hear you, Sean. I apologize. Um, I'm just wondering if, um, does somebody have the whole ticket portion clear in their minds? Because I'm not sure I really understand the whole ticket idea and what that's for and how they are utilizing that. Heather, go ahead. So um, for the, so our tickets each, I was actually just typing this out. So we're doing minutes equals to points and um, five, six points equals a badge. With the badge comes a ticket. And we're going to have three prizes um, for the age group that they can enter their tickets for, for the grand prize. And at the end, when your program ends, Beanstack will, the computer will draw your names for the winners for those, like their tickets that they enter for it. So um, we, that's how I've built it, is that we're going to have points equals badges with tickets. And then when they finish, the fifth badge is when they're done, they can get their free book, but they can continue to earn badges with those five points per badge um, and enter the tickets in for the grand prizes. That's, does that make sense? I... It does. I mean, I, I um, am just, I think I'm, what I'm finding is that we, had a really simple process for in person and being stack is perhaps going to make it a little more complicated again <laughs> so i think i maybe have to just change my mindset but that's what's going to happen and we'll make that work in some ways it's redesigning your program there's a lot of information in the chat, so I encourage you to um, take a look at the chat. Let me see, make sure I haven't missed anything. Feel free to keep me posted if any of you are looking at chat um, that you want me to see. So yeah, really great information on, on chat too and wonderful input. Feel free to use Kids List and Teen Talk as a way to connect with each other and ask questions of each other. That's why the listserv is there, so please use it. Um, I will get in and play around in the sandbox, but I have a feeling, I, I, I'm looking at the people, Heather Kent is three-fourths through, so I, she's going to be my person I'm asking questions of. <laughs> um, I, no, I, I won't. <laughs> Maybe I won't too much. Andrea? Just occurred to me, the one thing I remembered too from the webinar was um, they advise to create more than you think you might need. So I'm wondering what that is equating to for any of you. Like I see, you know, in the chat, someone's doing four activity badges and I, I think I have over a dozen at least yet. And I'm thinking, hmm, maybe that's not right. But then again, 
it also begs the question, are you extending your summer reading program range, time range? Because that was the other thing we considered because summer school has been canceled in Monroe. So we're thinking, you know, maybe, maybe we can capture that time um, with our program. Julie? We had extended our summer reading program through August 31st already last summer because we were finding we were actually still pretty busy in August. Um, so I feel like for this year, we're, we're definitely going to keep doing that, even though Beanstack said they don't suggest that. But I feel like especially this summer, I don't know what else they're going to do. Like, we might as well keep going through the end of August. Um, so, yeah, that's what we're doing. And in the chat, people are indicating they're going into August too. I feel like I missed somebody. Did somebody have a hand up? Okay. Let me, oh, Rachel. Oh, so at DeForest, we have our program is a little different. This is actually our second summer using Stack. I'm not the one that sets it up. We sets it up. We do have a web programmer that does that. Um, but we do books, so teens and adults, one book is one badge, uh, kids is five books for a badge, and then children, the read to me, are 10 books for a badge. We tried to make it as equal between all age groups as we could. We actually program every program, so we actually go above and beyond for the badges. They just have to read, I think, 20 or 30 books per reading program, so 20 or 30 badges, or is it just the 10 I don't remember but we do up to like a thousand badges that they can read too so we do allow them to or is it a hundred I don't know we our web person just went kind of all out and designed it that they could read above and beyond what we were expecting of them so um, and this year we are doing uh, we're still using our dragon dollars but they're going to be digital this year instead so they can still donate to charities and we're still working out how they can do their prize store shopping, whether it's the, we post once a week saying, this is what the prize store is, what would you like to buy? We're still, yeah, working on those little things. And it will be through our um, curbside pickup for collecting those. Rachel, how does that um, affect, do you have a completion badge then? And what portion of the badges do they have to collect to get that? Um, there is a completion. I believe now that I'm really thinking about it, I think it is just up to the 10 reading badges. So for adults, it's 10 books. For kids, it's 50 books. And then for the read to me, it's 100 books. Uh, we actually have quite a large portion of our children that finish their 100 books within the first couple weeks of the reading program. Um, and we're keeping our reading program basically the same as every year. So we are actually kicking off this Saturday is our big kickoff for summer reading and we're ending August 8th. But depending on how the summer goes, we did tell, or we are gonna tell people that they have extra time to spend their Dragon Dollars, whether it's the end of August or the beginning of March or, just, or September. So we're working on the kinks for all of it. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. And, and thanks for speaking from experience of using Beanstack. So you might be the one I ask questions of too. <laughs> okay. Um, and a few people have mentioned, oh, Julie, go ahead. Oh, this is a new question. So if you want to. Okay. I was just going to um, finish up with this. A few people have mentioned to join the Facebook group. Um, Heather and Amanda both mentioned that it's really good. That's something that I meant to do yesterday. So thanks for that reminder. All right, Julie, take it away. So my question has to do with minutes read. So we've always tracked books in the past, but we're switching to minutes right now. So it's a good time to do that. It seems like, um, but I'm not sure what is a reasonable amount to expect for what would be considered like completing the program. Seems like an average I'm seeing is maybe 800 to 1,000. Has anybody else already determined what like an reasonable amount is to expect a kid, say a school age kid, to read in the summer. Go ahead, Heather. 
So we we switched over to minutes because I had sixth grade students turning in that they read all the pigeon books in one day and that's what they're they're done with the summer reading program so we did minutes and for my my primary and younger kids i do 20 minutes is equal to one activity and they have to do five to six of those activities now they can do all reading which would be now i gotta do math 120 minutes per badge or um they can they have to do at least an hour worth of reading and then activities that are enriching as well, um, like writing book um, reviews. We did do like donating things to the food pantry. Of course, right now we can't, we don't know what that will be like, or going to a park and visiting a park. I have to adjust those activities that we used to have them doing for socialized, uh, social distancing. Um, I feel like it's isolation sometimes. Um, but we, I don't know how many like, I don't ever really gauge how many hours because they all the kids always go above and beyond those 20 minutes but i i started as a 20 minute guideline our teen librarian's going to do i think 30 or 40 minutes for each point that they'll be building so there's a lot of great information in the chat too about what others are doing for time. Um, Catherine from Cross Plains had a question that I'm hoping some of you might have an answer for. Um, can, be, can participants set their own goals in Beanstack? Rachel's shaking her head no. Michelle's saying no, okay. Well, that's too bad. Okay. Any other questions? Discussion about Beanstack? So, um, what or what do we need? What I'm hearing, we need time. <laughs> Always need more time to play with it. Um, yesterday, one, what I've been listening for, or what I would listen for on the webinar was any type of support that Beanstack provides for administrators like you guys to help out other colleagues and other staff members. There's a garbage truck going by outside, I apologize. Um, and I haven't looked, there, there are, um, there are some templates. So I will take a look at those. I know Christy from Spring Green asked at a prior meeting, the type of support that she can provide um, for her colleagues in helping them with it. So that's the type of information I'm really looking for. So if any of you have anything um, that you like, Rachel, if you've created something, um, and I'm, I'm not targeting you, but if you have something, if you could send it my way or send it out to kids list would be an even easier thing. Just anything we can do to share with each other and I can collect that information and, and pop it into a, a website that I'm working on for this too. Okay. Anything else that you'd like from the system for Beanstack? Knowing that having a system person who's actually used it is, is number one, so I'll get on that. Okay, so Jean Anderson and I have been looking ahead to fall and knowing that we don't know anything, we don't know what things are gonna look like in November, um, but we've been discussing the November Youth Programming Workshop. And we don't need to make any decisions at this meeting, but I just want to um, start putting the idea into your heads about thinking about how we want to move forward with uh, a continuing ed workshop about youth programming in the fall. We have the, the date is booked and I, I will get that to you um, for early November. It's always early November. Um, and typically it's at Old Brick Gardens. We have that date but we don't know if we we all feel comfortable meeting together on that day. And we've been talking about, is this something that we do in a webinar format? 
do we have a couple of webinars um, that day that we already have it scheduled. Um, the presenter who had reached out to um, is not able to present because she's having a baby in early November. So we're looking for a new presenter. Um, and she was going to be talking about collection development as well as programming. Um, so we're looking for presenter ideas too. My thought was, as we get a, a, you know, a couple of days or a couple of weeks go by, but I'll create some type of form where I can collect, we can collect um, information from all of you after a few more days have gone by, a few more weeks, just to start thinking about what would best fit your needs for the November workshop. All right, so I just wanted to, to put that out there. We don't have to make any decisions. We still have summer to get through. We still have beanstalk to learn. Um, but if you, if you have some burning desires of presenters or speakers or topics, we're starting to look for that information right now. Okay. All right, um, we're on to number six on the agenda, which is kind of our ongoing topic. We have virtual programming or virtual performers. Anything that you'd like to talk about in terms of virtual programming? Oh, Heather, thank you. Oh, I'll start the ball rolling because I've been going back and forth with three different performers right now and one of them's talked about Zoom and I am terrified and I hope other people can talk with me about doing anything on Zoom because I am reading horrible stories from horror stories from other libraries that are getting Zoom bombed and one library had a person hop in and use the n-word repeatedly during their performer the other day. Um, they've had child pornography put on to their meetings. Um, so, and I mean, like, besides trying to have them register, which is really tough to give them passwords and get everyone in, to make it inclusive for everyone, what are you guys doing to kind of provide without, with the safest possible thing, um, safest possible way to have your performers present for your communities, I guess is what I'd like to know. Because <laughs> uh, I'm scared about that. Erin, go ahead, please. I don't really have the answer. Um, my community is really afraid of Zoom. So even though we've been advertising that we would be doing some Zoom programs, um, I tested it out last week, Friday during book week. And whereas I normally get about, oh, 25 to 40 connections for story time. Um, for the Zoom program, I only had, I think, four families log in. Um, especially the schools won't told them that Zoom is not safe and so they aren't doing it. Um, I've been creating password protected and having them register and they get the link the day before or the morning of the event. Um, we use, I'm, I don't know if you all know, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses and we've been using Zoom since March for all of our meetings and we have never for, you know, we, we meet three, four times a week and we've never had anybody come in on the meetings. Um, there's a lot of, uh, if you go through the website into Zoom and set up all the different safety precautions, you know, and have the right things turned on and turned off, that's that's one thing to, to think about is to really make sure that you're applying all the safety precautions that Zoom is offering. But I, so I'm curious about the stories where people are hacking into Zoom meetings, like did they use any safety precautions did they use any passwords or safety measures? You know, so maybe that's why they're getting hackers. Um, and then also I've been attending a lot of storytelling events, music and storytelling events, and I'm about to today talk to one group from Minnesota that's using Eventbrite to register people, but the programs are Zoom. 
So I'm going to try and look into that today. So I don't have any answers, but I'm just really curious about all the scary Zoom things coming because people aren't using the passwords. Thanks, Karen. Amanda? Um, I talked to one performer we were considering for the Zoom performance this summer, and he told me that he would need us to be the Zoom admins for everything, um, which I don't know if I was interested in doing. So that's one thing to consider if you're thinking of having somebody do a virtual program for you, is do they have their own Zoom admin? Um, someone who knows how to set up the safety um, protocols, someone who's doing the waiting room thing where you let people in physically to the room versus just anybody joining, which it might be good to kind of have a double barrier, like you have the password protected link plus you have to be let in. Now, of course, somebody could write a normal sounding name and be let in and have, you know, bad purposes, but um, I think that might be one of the things if we do go with any Zoom performances is looking for someone who's really, a performer who's really comfortable and who has a second person who's just doing the Zoom part while they perform. Because I think it's impossible to perform and do the, the logistics at the same time. Karen, yeah. So um, one of the um, things that I've been doing every Monday at 2 p.m., a storyteller musician named Don White has been working with performers to try and help them learn all this new technology. And he says you absolutely need to have what he calls a muting deputy <laughs> so that you have your performer who's just able to perform. Then you have your librarian who is the MC and the, the host of the performance. And then third, you have a muting deputy who is purely working on watching the chats and watching who's arriving into the room. And um, another thing that you can do is require, however you use registration for your programs at the library, you have people register and then you give them the link like the day before or the morning of the program, depending on what time your program is. And then once you see that, and you tell them you have to be in the room by this time. So like, you know, five minutes before the start time of the program or something, you have to be in the room by then, and then they lock it. So I missed an event last night because I didn't get in on time and I went in late to arrive and I couldn't get in. I missed the event. So that's another safety thing is to lock the room. Um, but Zoom has tons of tutorials, pages and pages and pages of information about how to, you know, go into the, not just create a Zoom event, but to go in through the website and go in through that portal to create safety. and and admitting people and having a muting deputy or two. For my Zoom program, I had two muting deputies <laughs> um, who were working on watching the chats and watching the um, people coming into the room. Anyway. Go ahead, Amanda. A question if anyone has sprung for the paid Zoom account and if so, what the, uh, what the perks are, what the differences are. Um, Rachel and then Karen. So our director uh, bought a Zoom account, so we are paid. One of the perks is they do not cut you off at 40 minutes. I think that's the best one. I've actually been using Zoom for our Dungeons and Dragons program with the teens. So far it's been really easy and simple because um, I will, I asked them on our uh, website page to email me personally at my work email and I sent them the link that way and it is password. They have to go into the waiting room and then I let them in so I know who everyone is. Um, but yeah, that's to me one of the perks of having the paid is you can go as long as you need to for the Zoom meeting versus just 40 minutes. 
Karen. Um, I don't know all the benefits. I'm sure that there's several, but one in addition to the um, amount of time is also the number of people you can have in an event. And then also, I'm not sure, but I think that with a paid account, um, your audience can call in on the phone to be able to attend an event, which I think with the free one, they don't get a phone link. Um, I was going to try and look up and see what are the other um, benefits, but I I think there are probably other a few other benefits. Julie, did you have something to say about the the paid account? I just want to make sure that I didn't um, miss anything. I, I got distracted for a second, so maybe somebody said this, but we did get a paid account, and you do have to pay for a full year. You don't get like a month to month option. So I think it was a hundred some for a year's commitment. I know that's what I'm using right now. Go ahead, Karen. I paid for month to month, so I wonder if they changed something. Yeah, I don't know. My director actually did it. I didn't do it, so that's what she told us. But oh, maybe it's the difference between a personal account that I bought or a business oh. account. Oh, that could be. Yeah, I'm using South Central's paid account right now, and and when I set up the meeting, I'm able to put in a lot of those safety measures that Rachel and Karen mentioned too. So you know, putting in the um, the waiting room is something I can set up weeks in advance. I could make any one of you a host. So that host or a co-host would be the muting deputy. And I think we pay 199 a year, but I'm not sure at all what this is. As you can see, I'm Jean Anderson. So I have very, yeah, I don't know how much it is. Karen. Um, I don't know if the free one allows you to do screen sharing which is something that we used for my performer, where my performer shared videos of some of her, uh, it was a Nature Explorers program. And so I don't know if the free one, if you can do screen sharing. Amanda and Heather say, yes, you can do screen sharing with the free one. Along those same lines, Karen sent me an email yesterday from Sidari and Company, um, which is about their their virtual program. So I included just I copied what Karen sent me and put it right in the body of the agenda. There was also a lot of great um, communication between all of you yesterday afternoon about performers who have already you know, been very, very great about creating some virtual programs. So I'll gather that information too, but that's been um, going around on kits. So if you haven't had a time, time to take a look at that, take a look at some of the information that your colleagues are sending out too. Okay, anything else about, I actually caught about 20 seconds of Heather's um, virtual program, virtual story time that you had right before this meeting. So how is your own virtual programming going? Ours is going, mine is going good, but um, I'm having bandwidth problems, which I think I need to call Charter about. Um, but it's really fun because I've got, I have friends who are commenting from New York. So I have friends from home that are ch jumping in and it's weird to have people from not the immediate area suddenly becoming part of my every week life, which it's great. I love that my local kids are still doing it, watching it. Um, it throws me off when I see the live, like halfway through live will jump up the number of people viewing and then suddenly it drops because they rewind to the beginning and watch from the beginning. <laughs> um, but it's, I miss my kiddos though. I do like saying hi to everyone though. It's, mm -hmm. it's really fun to have kids geek out on last week. They're writing letters to my puppet that I use on Mondays and Wednesdays. So I'm getting letters at the library um, to my puppet from the kids. And one little girl wrote a whole thing out asking him why his name is Seymour, why, what his favorite food is. And the mom comments as I'm answering these during story time, my kids are geeking out all over the house right now. <laughs> 
And it's like, I wish I could see them geeking out because I'm answering this letter that they've sent to him. And that's been a lot of fun. Today was baby bounce day, though, which is my little guys. Oh. I, I don't know if, if those of you who are old enough to remember Romper Room, but it's making me think about when when she would look through her her spy glass and say, I see Heather, and I see Kristen, and I see Michelle. <laughs> look at everybody. That is exactly what I, I'm like, Romper Stop or Domper Do, did all my friends have fun today? <laughs> I would, that's what I want, that and I want to start my chapter days with, hey, all you cool cats and kittens, which I know I shouldn't start with that. <laughs> Rachel knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Andrea, did you have something? I had something, actually. Yes, thank you, Julie. Um, so we've been trying to follow the permissions guidelines that publishers have set out just for this time. I know there's debate about whether we could not even worry about it, but since they did that, we've been trying to follow it and it's been pretty reasonable to do. But as and I wasn't here last time, so maybe you talked about this already, but um, since all the deadlines are June 30th, um, we we're hoping to do summer story times. And so I have written to a couple publishers. I've written to School Library Journal to see if they have any insights, but are you all planning to go ahead with your summer story times um, and assuming that these permissions will be extended through the end of August? Yeah. Have you heard anything about that somehow? <laughs> that they will? Or just assuming they will because it's the right thing to do? Go for it, Andrea. I was just going to say, <laughs> I was going to make a crack about assumptions because I feel like that's all we can do at this point about a lot of things is just, it's either head spinning or um, just moving forward and having best intentions and hoping it's going to work out. In the chat, Melissa has um, written that she believes Macmillan has already extended through August. I I have a feeling other publishers will follow suit. I love being able to to pop in. Not that I'm watching entire story times, but if I happen to be on Facebook and I see, oh, what's going on at McFarland? That's how I happen to see um, Heather this morning. But it's I just love seeing all of you guys doing your your programs or having my kids watch. Karen. I don't know if this happened to anyone else, if you're doing Facebook Live story times, but Lynn and I both, I think it was yesterday, my days are getting mixed up, but Lynn from Sun Prairie and I both um, sat down to start our story time and Facebook wouldn't let us go live. Did that happen to you, Heather? So I got a message that um, it wasn't, Google Chrome was not recognizing my camera, right. which is a common pro, uh, problem that my director looked into. I had to download very quickly Firefox onto my laptop because it only works in Firefox right now. Um, so that scared, I was like, well, Storytime's having technical difficulties at the moment. We will be on in 10 minutes. Um, but yeah, that was uh, quite startling because Friday it worked and Monday it didn't. Right. Yeah, and so what I did, and I didn't, I, I, because I tried like updating Chrome and I tried figuring out what to do, and um, I don't know why I was, it wasn't working for with Firefox for me either. So I'm surprised you got it, but it wouldn't. So my computer just wasn't letting me do it. So I grabbed my um, phone. And I've been trying for so long. I'm really dumb technically, but I've been trying to get answers about how to make Facebook not mirror the image for Facebook Live with my phone. Well, I finally found some answers that just it's my phone that won't let me flip the image. So, but that's all I had tested. So I happened to have one of the book brackets from the library. I bent it up. I stuck my phone on it and I did it with the pictures backwards 
And I told the kids and the parents, I'm like, all your words are going to be backwards today. It's like reading a different language. <laughs> um, then after story time, I tried it with my iPad and duh, it worked with the iPad. I was able to flip the image um, and it was super easy to do. So uh, now I have that as a backup. But trying to figure out how to set your equipment I don't know, maybe you all have better circumstances than I do, but I have a mess behind me everywhere. I live in this 150-year-old house with windows that are drooping, you know, so the, the, the rainbows, like I'll end up with a rainbow on my face. And <laughs> um, so I'm really struggling finding a place in my house with the right lighting and trying to figure out the setup. One time I put my computer... I mean, my laptop on my computer to have it hold up straight up, and it turned my computer off, and so all my notes were gone. There's some great chat going on, too. Kelly uses her iPad um, for to do Facebook Live. Um, Heather, take a look at, at what happened. The video dropped on her end of the, of the video, but she kept going, so... Heather, you look great, by the way. You should give us some makeup tips because you look beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's my only excuse to get made up in the morning is because I know I'm going to be on a camera at some point. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I should have put some mascara on for you guys. You all deserve it. I'll try to remember next time. <laughs> okay. We are right at 11. Is there anything else that you want to ask or say? I hope you're all taking care of yourselves, drinking your water. Andrea? This might sound um, like too much. People may not, not be interested, but it just occurred to me, you know how we have to go in and check our bean stack um, challenges to make sure everything's working right and everything and have sort of like a, a faux account so you can approach it as a patron. And I'm just wondering if anybody would be interested in sharing those faux accounts so that other people might go in and experience their bean stacks because it may be very helpful for creating or simplifying, et cetera. I'll be your partner, Andrea. Send that information out on Kids List. If you want to share and play, please use that. I might ask all of you to, to play in the sandbox that I have too. Okay. Well, we won't have a check-in meeting next week because we have the two webinars, but the week after we will be returning to Wednesday afternoon at 1 p.m. So in the meantime, please use Kids List to connect to each other. Um, feel free to send me emails and um, have a really great day. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>